let's be like extra mindful to like quiet our minds and settle into that silent place. And, um, um, and in fact, when you want to start, I'd like to start with just uh, saying a few things in a very sort of like a meditative space to, uh, to set the ground for this. So just giving you a heads up on that. Um, so that song is not just words. So the, the, the deeper you can be present, uh, the better. And, and so this, while we're having to sit here, is a good opportunity to sink down into your space. Can I say a thing or two while we're waiting? I think we're ready, yeah. Uh, I'd like you to know that last night we watched the interview I did with you, so we enjoyed an hour with you already last night. Oh my God, this is going to be a Baba overload, but let's go with it. <laughs> and uh, we thought we would start with Rana. You already <laughs> met her for lunch and dinner in Rishikesh. Yeah. But get, actually, I want to sort of prepare the field with everybody for just maybe five minutes. Can I do that? Sure, whatever you like, whatever you like, yeah. I, there's just a few things I want to say. And one is that, okay, everybody's eyes are closed. We've been in the meditative space, right? Just stay there for a second. And see if you feel a, the sense of presence in the room you can tell that you're not alone. You're sitting with a lot of other people, your friends. You, can you feel that, that you're not alone? Presence is the aroma of being. And you are being. So because presence is the aroma of being, we are marinating this background of each other's presence. So even though we're going to use words tonight, we don't want to just fill our head with words. Uh, I want to invite you to stay connected with presence. And when we have moments of silence to just sink even that much further into this uh, resonance with each other, that is uh, the, the background vibration of, of meeting together in satsang and in sangha. And just one more thing, you know, the thing that hip hop artists, satsang teachers and yoga teachers have in common, you know, they're always telling you what to do. Put your hands in the air. Um, and I just want to, I resist that, but there, I would like to do one ohm to start out because um, we aren't, this isn't just a mental effort. There's an element of grace. There's an element that there's a, a higher self or the one infinite being present and it doesn't need to change you. You're perfect the way you are. There's no moral demand or imperative from the universe for you to get better. But we decide to evolve because it's less suffering, more love, more joy to, so to invite 
grace to invite help in that change. Um, just saying one little mantra um, in the absence of a happy little kirtan, you know, I think gives permission. So if we could just do one ohm and then do questions. Thank you. Now, how would you like, what would you like to do, hi Radha? Hello, very nice to meet you again. <laughs> And actually, this, you. this meeting with you has inspired us to try to come to Rishikesh at the end of October. So we've started planning a retreat in Rishikesh. Thanks, thanks to you. Thank you. I I'm, I'm hope I'm there. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping for uh, four months a year in Rishikesh, three months, something like that. It's just like my home away from home. We look and now that my my home at home is squashed by a tree, that uh, it's become even more homey to me there. So we'll see. You know, I hope we all. I see a lot of you in Rishikesh uh, in the future, and maybe for a lot of the future. And I'm going to invite people to come up to talk to speak whenever they're ready, because I might just be tempted to be present and stare until somebody won't make you say something. <clears throat> I wrote something down. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't actually have a particular question, but um, yeah, living here, I see um, many people coming and also leaving when they get challenged and i myself yeah i have the experience from time to time time facing difficult painful moments so i was yeah i would like to ask you if you like to share from your own experience um about facing difficult moments and going through them on the spiritual of your own spiritual path and maybe getting the benefit of 
going through difficulties? Good question. Um, the, the hard thing about the spiritual path is it's a shift in identity, right? It, we've developed this ego, this, this internal dialogue that's always talking in our heads about ourselves and this cloud of self-referential thinking becomes us. And shifting out of that into being centered in presence and love is really the death of this thing that we've given life to. It's almost alive because our thoughts are made of consciousness, which is life itself. So there's this conscious thing that thinks it's us, and it's going to be starved of oxygen if it doesn't just keep repeating in our heads its story about ourselves. So it's this life or death struggle, and the thing that's dying is in charge in a way. It's, it, it's going to feel suffocated unless it is a shift into bliss. As Baba in the Himalayas used to say, nobody gives up anything unless they're getting something. Buddha gave up all these kingdoms and uh, riches and a wife and all the things. He got his bliss. So the flip side of losing this, this mind that can resist and fight and want to run is having a better place to be. And so doing these practices and developing that, that sense of presence, that sense of mindfulness and wholeness makes it much, it gives you a place to move to, it gives you a place to rest in. And from there, these difficulties are just another experience. I've done a lot of uh, rock climbing you know, I used to live in Yosemite and there's big cliffs and I was guiding rock climbing. And the funny thing about rock climbing is it's full of fear and pain. You know, you're hanging on the side of a cliff, you could die, you put your hands in the rock and sometimes they'll even bleed. And there's always this threat of some painful consequence. And even just sitting there is, is a rock poking at you. And, um, it's uncomfortable and sometimes fearful a lot. But because we do it for fun, it becomes an adventure. So sometimes um, it's our resistance to our experience that makes for the misery and not the experience itself. So I could invite you to reframe that when something is triggered and you're in difficulty, that you could consider it to be an opportunity like, okay, something within me has come up and that's an obstacle for me. And if I can like, you know, make this to my advantage or deal skillfully with it, then, uh, then that's an adventure in and of itself where I can just experience it. And once I'm not running from the experience, it's just like, oh, I don't want to sit here right now or oh, all these people or whatever it is. Um, be in that experience, you know, the cliche words as a witness or from the sense of your being, keep returning to mindful presence and, uh, and go through it. And if that doesn't work, you know, do what you have to do, run away for a while, you know, but uh, the idea is the center of being and the source of love that is you, that's home. And what happens in life is the more you are in the spiritual path, the more you live at home and something will throw you off. You know, your heart might be broken or somebody upsets you or you're just antsy and, and you get taken from there. And so you recognize, oh, I'm off my center. I'm, I'm away from home. You just get back. Um, you know, once you realize it, go, I'm going to center myself, I'm going back home. And if you keep going back, going back and going back, pretty soon the road back gets faster and you spend less time away from home. And uh, 
and that should help things. But um, there's no uh, unless you're or, or, unless you're already in your bliss, then there's bound to be difficulties as the mind squirms to uh, not give up its role as master. So many uh, distractions and uh, conflicting things in the world out there. I'm really especially impressed when younger people go on the spiritual path because back in the old days of India, there was just like, you know, some impoverished farming and there's no TV and there's no all these different jobs that you could do. You're in your caste. You know, there's all kinds of time. It was a lot easier for people to just go, okay, let's go do the spiritual path. But uh, we have a very like short attention span in, in the West. And so it's very easy to be antsy and run away. So I extend that respect to everyone there that's chosen to do something that's uh, not necessarily an easy thing, but is the greatest investment in the rest of this life and, uh, and our you know, experience beyond that, even though the one thing we can take with us. You don't have to beat yourself over the head too hard with it because then it creates a reaction. So, you know, go with the flow a little, don't be too hard on yourself. Anytime we make something too big a deal, it starts to have more power over us than it really um, than it really needs to. We have ups and downs, so what? And in the spiritual community, sometimes there's a a subtle I don't know what to call it a subtle need to be extra spiritual because that's what you're doing there almost in some I don't know about your community but it's other places it be almost like a little competition to be spiritualier than now and not be you know off your game and all that sort of stuff and um in, invite you to um, to ease off on that because it just creates a an obstacle. There's a there's this part of the ego, part of this self referential um, mind of ourselves that, uh, as we were growing up, it was comparing itself to what our parents told us to do: and study hard in school, and then we get a job, and we have to like be work our way up the the profession chain in the job and have extra responsibilities at work and we apply this this like same mentality to spirituality and it gets us to compare you know our assessment of ourselves with the way we think we should be and that just really perpetuates um the cycle of insecurity and and you know, mental disturbance that we're trying to like let go of. You always just return to being and mindfulness and and whatever imperfection surrounds that. You can you can see where it comes from, but trying to be perfect 
doesn't work. I don't know what to say. I feel a bit blank. <laughs> well, you know, drawing a blank is good. You, well, Papaji used to do this teaching of like, watch where the, see if you can see where in your mind from what the thought arises. So even though if we're thinking, 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 somehow when you're trying to watch for where the thought arises, you draw a blank. It's, it's like that sound of one hand clapping, right? There's no answer to this. It's meant to blow your mind. But if your mind is blown, stay there and uh, in that space because the self is never an object of experience as it's the experiencer. So if your mind is a blank, then good. But uh, I don't know how you guys roll exactly. So uh, you guys have to guide me through your process. I'm, I'm just uh, being present with whoever comes up and it's really good to see you. Um, okay. The next person's a chance. It's very beautiful to see you again. Maybe we meet yeah, good to see Rishikesh. You. <laughs> Rishikesh. We've all been we've been, <laughs> all been deprived of so much. So the uh, this is the world equivalent of that ego struggling because <laughs> uh, with COVID there's been so many lockdowns, right? And so everyone's ego is disturbed because the way we're used to seeing ourselves as that person at work or this musician or uh, whatever you do is disturbed. So you'll notice that people are going crazy um, from the stress of the disruption in their lives. You mean, I think so. Okay. So we have Indira and last yeah. night she okay. started her <laughs> career sharing her truth. <laughs> so it's a nice moment for her to meet you. Uh, it's a very auspicious time, Indira. Like, you know, it was just so um, you get so like, superstitious about the moon and the cycles of the earth and stuff. And and tomorrow, actually, yeah, it's seven hours from now in Delhi because the silent day, which is the entire island is silent. They you're not supposed to light any fires or 
light light lights and no cooking and everybody's shut down. There's no traffic on the street. So it's considered like the very high holy days right now. So mm -hmm. um, I feel also honored to be um, invited to sit with you all tonight. Mm. Lucky time for these things. I wanted to ask you if you um, like to share something about your time with Papaji. Because I mean, from my experience, when you have a spiritual master, you can experience the most beautiful, but also the most horrible moments with him. And I wanted to ask you about your experience with Papaji, if you also had this moments and you like to share something about it. Well, you know, I, I, we all are have this very individual path, right? And uh, uh, we, there's no awakening by the numbers or just kind of doing what you're told and doing all the right practices and and waking up. And, and for me, my day and night awakening was when I was about eight, 19, I guess, and that just rocked me completely and that i studied with a lot of masters for maybe 10 years before i met papaji i was pretty ripe when i met papaji and some of the other masters i had been with had hundreds of disciples and i was always wanting to have somebody you know like an individual master somebody i could relate to one-on-one -on -one. and i met papaji and it was just like the answer to that prayer and yet i would just be in his presence and i really didn't have a question i he flipped the script on me that i wasn't trying to walk on water or gain some light and power experience that I needed to like, you know, inhabit my own being. And so I went there and then we would just like stare at each other. And my big main stress with Papaji was just that I, my mind would get so quiet and just be sitting with him. And this part of my mind would start to ache, it would ache to think. It was just like <sighs> wanting to think, and I just had to get used to this <sighs> quiet. And um, he didn't give me grief about anything. He didn't. He was super sweet. He invited me. To, I just had him to myself mostly. He would take me through the bazaar and and order me a, a mango lassi, or he ate dinner a couple times at his, his family place. So. It wasn't like that kind of thing where you have a spiritual master and he's got jobs for you to do and responsibilities. And then there's all kinds of stress where he's kind of like pushing on your ego. I, I got off easy with Papa G. <laughs> and, and back those days, he was resistant to keeping any decide. He loved it if you loved him, but he wasn't trying to build an ashram or an institution or whatever. So he'd like, you know, you got your thing with Papaji, send you off. He used to like write letters once in a while from the uh, United States to India. He was very uh, loving and supportive, but, uh, you know, it was a, a different paradigm than once you got a whole satsang of people and, um, and, and, everybody starts bouncing off each other and um, mm. triggering each other's stuff. And when did you leave him? I, I mean, I was only with him for maybe about three weeks in 1986. And then I met him again in New York for a week or two, um, uh, maybe 1989, I don't know, just like a couple years later. And, um, and I, I 
never felt to go to Lucknow, so I didn't. I always I'd go to India once in a while. I'd go up in the Himalayas before I left his his body, and then there was no more time to see him. And I kind of I, you know, I would say I regret that, but I think we were just good with each other. I I got what I needed from him, and uh, I didn't have that kind of connection where um, where it needed to be otherwise. Mm. I always, in fact, in a lot of these spiritual groups, stayed on the periphery a little bit. Never wanted to dive in and and uh, be in the center of commitment and responsibility for whatever um, fault or virtue was in that. I don't know, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. What's your experience in that same question turned back to you? <laughs> well, that's what that I brought John... is my experience. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, John, David, in satsang, he seems like such a sweet little bear and stuff, but does he have a ruler and, and whack, on your, whack on your head if you like fall asleep in meditation? Actually, Papa G did that to me. That's the one time he got mad at me. I was meditating with him in a apartment in new york and i don't know if what happened i i i don't know if it was a sleepy meditation i thought everything was just fine and i came out of it and he was he was like when you're going to meet the divine do you fall asleep and uh i was like i don't know i don't know papa g we didn't call him papa g back then it was papa G. papa g came later but uh i just had to absorb that as um it's stuff that happens. Okay, I make space for somebody else. Very nice to meet you. Very nice. Nice to meet you too. I'm uh, sorry I'm not <laughs> full of words. I've always been like not somebody to talk for the sake of uh, talking, but if there's something to talk about, I'm happy happy to be in the space with you and wishing yes. you the best on uh, you know everything you should choose to do in this uh, razor's edge of sharing your experience and. Um, Letting that truth flow through you and love. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, hello. <laughs> You've got shiny eyes. <laughs> you know, I don't see how I have shiny eyes. I got the squintiest <laughs> eyes, you know, and and some of the things I think are beautiful and other people are things that I don't have, like like really dark eyebrows like you have. I got no eyebrows. They go, oh, beautiful eyebrows. And the big soulful <laughs> eyes, you know, oh my God, those are like... <laughs> I think I meant yeah, something. I got squinty little eyes with bags under them. Oh my God. But somehow I, we, I can still connect. So I think the shine is definitely some supernatural space because. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <it's> just, yeah. <laughs> okay. However, now I come to my question. <laughs> um, 
when you look back on your whole life, would you say that you always felt something like guided and protected? Did you have like a basic trust or did this maybe change or came only later when you yeah, found out who you really are? You know, they say the spiritual path, there's two spiritual paths. One's the rainy path where you're suffering and you're looking for the way out of suffering and spirituality, meditation, all those promise you a way of curing all this misery that you're in. And then there's the sunny path where it's like you get a, a, a hint of the light and you want more of it and you seek after this bliss. And I've definitely been more on the sunny path. I, I've never really been miserable. But like up until I was say 18 or 19, I'd never even heard of the spiritual path. I hadn't heard of meditation or past lives, altered states of consciousness. My experience of religion was you go to church and go, oh, please God, you're such a great God. Please don't burn us in hell and give us good stuff, protect us. And there was just such an obvious lack of experience and blind faith in that. I had no idea that you could experience beyond that. But when I awoke to myself, which is very sudden and, and kind of extreme, I could recognize moments from my childhood when I was like in that space where I was just being, and in fact, when I was a kid and I got introduced to nature, and one of my first spiritual experiences was coming into Yosemite and seeing the beautiful nature and cliffs and waterfall, and I was just stunned. My mind was stopped. And from that point on, I, I had this desire to like, just like learn edible plants and go out into the mountains by myself and live in a meadow like a hermit. And I didn't want to do that for any like notably spiritual reason. I just thought that was this peaceful, beautiful way to live. And, and looking back on it, that's kind of a strange goal in life. And, um, and I think a lot of us right now in the West are we're yogis and shamans and, you know, deep spiritual people um, in a past life. And in the Bhagavad Gita, they call that yoga brashta. You don't finish your spiritual path in a life. And then you come back and the seeds of this are, are in you. But then you're, you know, you're born in this meat suit on a rock going around the earth and it takes a while to mature and learn the language and become ripe for the state you're in so the seeds of the state you're in were there but at some point you awaken to where you left off basically and i think that's what happened to me i was i was never disturbed i was never miserable i was just a little bit in the fog of my insecurity and then suddenly I cracked open. And, but then you know, looking back, there was this time just like, yeah, this was always in me. And, and I think it's in a lot of people. I, I, once you kind of have been awake for a while, it, it, it's hard to remember exactly what it's like to forget that unless somehow you get really attached. But uh, I remember when my dad was dying of cancer. And he was just a few weeks, a week or two out. And he didn't, he didn't really know spirituality. He didn't know it at all, really. And he was a good-hearted guy, sweethearted. I looked at him and, he, you know, he used to be a, a star athlete. And he had a master's degree. And he was 94 and he couldn't remember what day it was. He was weak and he was about to die. And I said, well, Dad, you know, he used to be a star athlete. And now, you, you know, you, you're having trouble getting out of your chair and you have a master's degree and yet you, you probably couldn't tell me what day it is but you and I are talking now and isn't there a part of you that has always been there when you were young when you were middle-aged and when you're old now that's always always been the same it's always you know witness changes and nodded his head and I go oh, that's that's you and 
what you're always going to take with you it's eternal and um you're not going to lose that and in, in some ways that can feel a little unimpressive while we're in this earth suit because it gets dimmed by our mind scattering it and just the the density of our individuality in a physical world but um you know, it's living in a room, right? The light is living in the room of ourselves. And so that's what sadhana and meditation and things do. It's like cleaning up the room so the light can like shine through the windows a, a little brighter and, and, and pick up steam. So somehow, you know, I've always been the same being and somehow I woke up to it in a more profound way. And now I don't know if it's even completely honest to like rely on memory to, to see how I was before because it starts to be inconceivable. Maybe I know, maybe I don't. Mm -hmm. It's funny, even the last years and decades since then, I could say I've changed. You know, the room has got cleaned up. And people might go, oh, you've changed this way and this way and this way. And like, for me, it's like, there's a part of me that hasn't changed. And that's the part I identify as myself. So yes, I've changed. And no, I haven't changed. And um, I don't know if I have the right words for that, but I'm sure many of you can relate. And then, you know, the, the Papaji change was instead of seeking to be a spiritual Superman, I was turned around to sink into the being in presence that I already was. And so that was a, a complete change. And yet there I was again, the way I always was. So um, and then we're, we have a lot of different layers and dimensions to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Yes. <laughs> Hello. So this is Arjuna. He's a Ukrainian. Arjuna. Yeah, he's a Ukrainian guy. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what does it mean, Ukrainian guy. <laughs> Maybe you know question. there's a revolution in eastern europe i'm here in bali and in, in india and the yoga and meditation is filled with people from ukraine different parts of the former soviet union so it seems like something very a lot of very beautiful people are, are expecting you know, that Yeah, so there is a question. But it's just the decorations of the room we're living in, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. There is a resistance sometimes, which is very strong structure. Yeah. And the structure in this system, in my system, 
and sometimes it feels very heavy and uh, I could say sometimes it's like a feeling this resistance on the way to something beautiful and uh, I would like to ask you to talk a bit about this uh, yeah please talk about uh, this let me uh, let me ask you more about the resistance like is is it clear where it comes from where the where the friction arises from what relieves the resistance and tell me about your resistance yeah it's a kind of complex feeling so there is something there is um for example there is a thought oh i did something wrong or i'm not uh, enough you know i'm not enough i'm not good enough or i'm not i did something wrong and then immediately in the mind i start to kind of explain to myself oh i couldn't uh, do anything different and blah 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 and it take over my mind you know and then there is this tendency to find the object kind of the authority like i don't know like a master or a father which i start to explain i'm not so bad i'm not so and it's going in my mind yeah and um i don't know it's just an energy in the system it co contracts contracts no i mean what you're describing is fortunately it's not that complicated really because this voice in our heads that compares us with how we should be and has judgments about our progress and where we are could do better or what we should be doing or how other people see us it's it's the pure form of the construction of our false identity this series of thoughts in ourselves that we've had since childhood when you think of a child being born in the world it's just an amorphous lights and and our parents teach us that we got to do this we got to do this and this voice in our head starts trying to meet all the expectations of the world and when you're in school you want to be popular or you want to be smart you're always seeking validation from your parents from the teachers and this just becomes an intense habit we're living in our heads and we're playing this game of being enough there's no winning this game like if you were the richest guy in the world or the most beautiful woman in the world or the smartest person in your field they all have another insecurity about what they're not there's just you people are always moving the goalposts up it's probably a million people in the world that would love to be you because that's where their goalposts are once they're you they're going to move their goalposts again so know that there's no winning this game right the the game is won by letting go of it and and uh moving into the space of being that you are within and you can you know if you want to play a game with it, you can even uh go against it, make a fool of yourself like, mm -hmm. hey, i just made a fool of myself in front of 30 people Woo! now i can just stop worrying about like if i'm a fool or not because i proved it <laughs> um there's no winning this game and there's no cure i mean you can make it a little better right if you try harder or you know you're a good meditator then you can you know think you've got made some progress but it's it's like all the goalposts in life once you're there you just raise the bar so um as long as you're experiencing that you know that it's just like a sickness right we have the sickness of that we're addicted to our comparison and judgment of ourselves and you know you see yourself doing it and going like ah look i'm doing this and uh and that takes a little of the uh the bite out of it to know that you know it's just this illusion we're suffering that uh, we've got to compare ourselves um with our idealized self and uh and not worry about it too much sort of like being drunk 
or it's stoned or something. You go like, the, I sometimes think the world's like this big drunk party where everybody thinks they can drive. I can drive. I'm perfectly okay to drive. It's like, no, you can't drive. It's sort of like ego is bothering you. It's sort of like, I see my ego going right now. And I'm so it's just like being a little ego drunk for a minute, not going to worry about it, not going to make a big decision and yell at anybody until I'm, you know, back at my center. You know, it happens. It's just part of the game that we have to like not make too important while we're, you know, getting beyond it. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I mean. Uh... <laughs> it's, you know, habits, you know, you could get the answer and it doesn't necessarily change it right away, right? Um, mm -hmm. We, this is, we're breaking the oldest habit that we have. You know, the way we've constructed our way of thinking and being within ourselves, it's a deep habit. And uh, and maybe it takes grace to break it, and maybe some practice will, you know, make it better. And so, you know, do what you do and do your, do your, uh, do your spiritual practice. But, uh, yeah, recognize it, that it's just the, you know, common illusion of, humanity that we're all um, we're all facing this. I have a refrigerator home that says the only normal person, the one you don't know very well. And uh, so everybody has the same insecurity and resistance. And you also had this, yeah? I'm sure. <laughs> And I mean, I'm sure that, you know, that, that, that the reverberations of this, you know, are, are in me. I'm not like suffering from it, but I, I guess if I had to, like, you know, I'd be like a guy and I don't even want to like go ask directions on the street. Um, so I don't want to say I'm free, but I also not, you know, I not suffering. And I may almost maybe too content with my imperfection. <laughs> I don't work on it very much. I'm almost too content with my oh. <laughs> And there's people that are really good about being disciplined about doing all kinds of sadhana and cleaning up the whole house. And, um, and you know, I honor that. We're all at the like, go with, you start from where you're at and, and do what you're able to do. And uh, I'm not one of these guys that's gonna master all the yogas. And, and I, in fact, I used to know all kinds of scriptures. I've had years of university, Hindi and Sanskrit, and I, I knew so many things, so many techniques. And, and I've lost that. I, I've like, now there's hardly anything I can say. So I, I can only answer a few questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Carl. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them and really wonderful to meet you. Um, if, it, if you feel resistance, you feel resistance, don't worry about it. You know that there's a part of you if I could see it like brimming a little bit, like, um, you know, that's a happy heart and, uh, and, you know, be in that. And if you're resistant, you're like, ah, look at this. I hate everything right now. <laughs> so we have Rajen now. I won't tell you that he's Norwegian.
Yes. I have a confession. <laughs> I know you're Norwegian. John told me, and I know he shouldn't have, but he did. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it matters so much where I'm from. <laughs> it depends on the question. Sometimes our cultures are part of our obstacles mm -hmm. and sometimes they're not. You seem uh, very friendly. It's like uh, meeting an old friend. Thank you. Mm. You know, this, uh, this branch of the spiritual path of, um, you know, sort of self-realization through inquiry or direct knowledge has a reputation for being a little dry and intellectual. But uh, they say that all paths lead to the same place. And this place is 
by its own nature the source of love. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really trust anybody that doesn't have love as being any place spiritual that I want to aspire to. So um, I'm not all the way grown up yet. I, I sort of missed having a midlife crisis by not even growing up that much. And I'm, now I'm too old to have one. So um, I suffer, I suffer from too much fun and I love everybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wouldn't give up the love for anything. Mm. Yeah, you talked about um, your childhood in some way and uh, something that uh, really resonated with, with me, um, especially the last couple of days. In meditation, I felt um, kind of this very strong connection to to myself as a child or something like this, and uh, uh, kind of recognizing uh, how deeply I was taken care of, um, and in some way it was by my my parents and my grandparents, but I can also see that it's not really personal like i was taken care of by the universe and it's uh, yeah you know, yeah and it's so beautiful. it's really good to uh you know there's there's this transcendent being that that we are mm. right and we're trying to you know be centered in this pure awareness but there's also life and we're navigating life you know this and a lot of uh, Vedanta and non-dualism in the past have been like, forget the world, just be detached from everything and don't like pay any attention to life. And I think that paradigm might be changing a little bit. I think it's possible to know yourself and, uh, and sort of manifest a, a beautiful poetic life for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we're Dan, that, Life is like dancing, you know, as we think and act keeps getting reflected back to us and we can almost, uh, I won't say perfect our experience, but we can mold our experience forward this way. So having the idea that we're protected and that there's a perfection to everything um, is a, it's, it is a beautiful idea and a beautiful shield and it, it allows us to, you know, accept what happens without being a victim of it. Um, and gratitude um, that there's somebody that, you know, wiped our butts when we were a, a kid and had to sacrifice a lot of, you know, fun activities to take care of a, a baby. You know, a, a lot of us didn't have a great childhood, but um, it, there's something to having that, um, you know, gratitude toward everyone who has touched us along the way and, and to <laughs> our friends and spiritual masters and, and everybody along the path. And the more um, love and gratitude and feeling of protection that we have within us, the more it just sort of uh, feeds back to us. And it's, it's a lighthearted thing. And, uh, and this love and light heart is uh, an embodiment of ourselves. Um, a lot of times in this um, self-realization, we're we're trying we're trying to be this thing that we can't see, the source of ourselves. And because we can't see it, it's really kind of hard to to grok this beingness behind the curtain that we are. Um, and sometimes it's almost easier to see where love arises from, where joy arises from. It's also that love is the aroma of being. And up some levels where it gets to be jealous or attached or about this or this, then it's, it gets mixed up with the mind and lust or all the different things that we have going on. But like the source of love and joy in our hearts which can you know be triggered by gratitude it's um it's close to the source and once you get close to the source you just sort of be there and it'll draw you in on its own yeah 
So you, you talked about uh, living in uh, Yosemite, um, and it, uh, to me, it seemed that you you've been quite a lot in solitude with yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, is it correct? And and why? Well, like I'm a creature of extremes, and mm -hmm. what I would say is when I say this everybody has their own makeup. You know, we have this oneness within, but for some reason, the universe becomes all these different people and does all these different dramas and we all have our own path. So this is like my individual way of being is take a lot of space, I go whole days without talking to anybody, I'm communing in nature and having adventures in nature. And then I'll go to like Burning Man or a music festival or something. And I'll socialize like a madman for three or four days or, or a week and I'll have a hundred people a day. And uh, so yes and no, this, um, I, uh, I have a balance of extremes. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I guess it's also not really a, a choice in some way. It's for me, I mean, I also, I grew up in nature and I spent a lot of time in nature and also meditating a lot there. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, this is something I really need. But now I'm living in a community and there's basically no private space anymore. But then now that's totally fine. So... No. We're very, you know, adaptable creatures. So mm. if you find yourself getting off, you know, um, it can be good to like go find some nature and be with it for a mm. while and sort of like check yourself and soak that in a little bit. But, um, you know, one of the basic principles is if, you know, you're, if it's all good, it's all good. Mm. <laughs> you're good in community. Then there's a, there's a nature to everything. There's a beauty to everything. Mm. Uh, and just in everybody's face and in everything around you is still nature in a way. But uh, I do like to, you know, attract to the beauty in nature. So to make a point of you know, making sure I get a dose once in a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look very relaxed. <laughs> I've got so little stress. I'm really happy to uh, <laughs> to, to, to give uh, satsang a little bit because um, mm -hmm. I feel like I want my love to flow. I like, I like to serve a little bit, but it's really easy for me. To, uh, I've manifested a pretty free life, and uh, mm. and so I want to give back a little. But it's, it's funny, you know, I guess I could say I have stress. I loved my place in Yosemite. I lived for 22 years and it was just destroyed. So now all my, all my belongings are under a big pile of snow in a broken cabin in Yosemite waiting for me to rescue them. I had COVID in uh, December, so I was sick for a while. What else happened? Lost a bunch of money in the stock market in January. So sort of like I've had people come, come to me and go like, Carl, all kinds of stuff happened to you. How are you doing? I go, really? What happened to me? And they go, oh, this, this, this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, I broke my leg on a motorcycle in India that year and this and this. I was in bed for seven weeks. Um, I, it hasn't bothered me too much. And sometimes you could take whatever, like, stressful thing happens to you. And I call it, like, spiritual Aikido. It's like, how can I, like, turn this disadvantage into an advantage how can i um you know how can i make a blessing out of this curse and like uh, for me it could be almost like a game and i won at it for a while and you know knock on wood um, hoped Okay, thank you very much. But I also avoid, you know, like hard stuff that might be, a, you know, an oppressive task for me. So I, I, I honor the people that make a commitment to be in community and not have any private space and all the stuff <laughs> that I don't have the guts to do. You guys are rocking. <laughs> They're allowed out once a month. <laughs>
You put a, like a, a collar on them or some kind of ankle bracelet to to know where they've been or <laughs> let them out for a month. <laughs> okay, thanks, Cole. Good to meet you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Oh, this is Prema. Sorry. I don't remember where she's from. <laughs> He's just saying that because he told off the other guy from uh, Norway and he said he wasn't supposed to do it. Right. right. <laughs> I'm a quick learner. That makes one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it feels very friendly and relaxed um, with you. California, that's why. <laughs> We're chill there. I'm in Bali too, very sweet and chill. Mm.
feels like words never can touch this what is really there it's completely hopeless that the um, <laughs> we can talk about our problems and we can talk about our resistance and life all the things but um you know buddha wouldn't wouldn't talk about a soul or god and because of that a lot of philosophers and religious people like criticize buddha they say he was a nastika which means uh there isn't uh, uh, like an atheist but you know whatever is there is there when you start talking about god or a soul or whatever you start applying concepts and ideas to this thing but it's just so beyond a concept and so beyond an idea that uh there's you know you could never have a concept of it and it's still still there and if you can go into that space you can't really bring anything out of it but not because it's nothing but because it's everything but not a thing there's no things in it so um it's the it's the undivided everything that becomes time and space and our whole manner of perception and relating is rooted in time and, and space so like the, the mind is just doesn't have the equipment to to deal with that space you can only just kind of hang your mouth open and go like whoa Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, Carl, I just to tell you, we've still got a bunch of people who would like to meet you if you've still got time. I have all night. You know, it's uh, it's uh, you guys that might. Uh, hey, we can um, go all day. We, we see who wins. Yeah. So, you know, like you, you have to manage the entertainment value of the, the thought song. If we like stare at each other too long or, you know, what, what, whatever, whatever it is we're doing, I'm along for this ride and. Uh, and uh, I stay up late, so. Okay, it's all fine, lovely, beautiful.
I'm going to a little bit intercede at this point because there are other people and you won't believe this, but at seven o'clock, which is in an hour and a quarter, we have another broadcast from Bali. Do you know mm. Mara Nand, Mara Nand, uh, Margaret Anand? She's a Tantra whiz kid and she's broadcasting. Oh, Margot Anand, I've heard the name. She yeah. must be somewhere there in Bali and she's going to give a broadcast at seven, which we've signed up yeah. for. And this guy can sit with you for the rest of the day. <laughs> we, 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 we already had a good long sit the other day when we were setting this up. So we're, we're good at sharing yeah, yeah. space together. Reminded me of um, one, uh, uh, a little Papaji, some, one of Papaji's Delhi disciples arranged a little sat song when I was there and there's just like three or four Indian guys and we were all just like sitting in the silence and it was silence and silence and he had this one disciple that just didn't get it and he piped up and said Papaji how do we think about the self and uh, everybody laughed and um, then there was some more silence and then another guy was like you know, uh, at Raman Ashram, there was the same sort of peaceful silence and, and it felt just like it does right now. And, and then it just sort of dawned on him. You, know, you could see it like dawning on him how you know, this, this silence was, there was a beingness to it. Anyway, it's my little story about the value of the silence. <laughs> I, can see him I tickle you if I was there. Somebody tickle him. <laughs> I think you're already tickling everybody, actually. <laughs> this is Raj. Raj. Hello, Baba. Hi. <laughs> If anybody wants to tell me their favorite or personal John David story too, I'm happy to hear it.
Mm. It was a bit funny. It was like, um, should I stay here? Should I go to the written question? Yeah. You have a question? We can do it. <laughs> Dear Baba, thank you for this meeting. With you, I feel there is so much heart. In the normal process of my life, I get too much involved with structures of my mind and believing the commentaries of it. Often it seems very hard to find a way back. Can you please talk about this? Much love to you, Raj. Well, you know, um, sometimes our strengths are also our weaknesses like uh, for very like smart and uh, intellectual people or driven people gives you a great power to realize things and and think of things um and then it's it's harder to focus on the heart um it could lead you uh, less toward that uh, so Sometimes for the like very for people that are more serious, I would tell them like, go out and dance <laughs> or sing, you know. Um, and the other thing is to pray for an open heart. And you know, I'm not a big one for pr like um, pray God for like oh I want a, a woman or financial abundance or all these things, but it's really good to pray for an open heart um, because it's almost a matter of grace. And uh, Sargadatta said once, um, people asked him, what's the most important thing? What's the key? And he said, sincerity. If you have sincerity of your motive and intention, then, you know, everything takes care of itself. So, in, in some ways, a uh, prayer is kind of an intention of, an expression of intention and, and sincerity. So um, it's not a bad idea to do things to, to break the ice with yourself a little bit and also to, to like express and manifest that ice breaking in ways that, uh, that focus on um, on that polarity. You guys all uh, should have a little like community dance session once in a while. <laughs> Shake out the energy a little bit. Yeah, thank you. It's resonating. All these, you know, everybody's got a heart. All these people you're with, you know, are on this path. And you're all, you know, don't love each other in a fake way, but um, but there's. There's love all around you. Sometimes people are going through their stuff and it uh, bring, draws people inward a little bit, you know, but uh, you've got an innate joy. It's part of, part of the experience. Never. Thank you very much. <laughs> very beautiful. <laughs> so now we have Pavati. She's the community, amazing community cook. Mm, that's an important job. 
I used to hang out with this uh, tantric bob up in the Himalayas. He used to feed us till we couldn't eat anymore. And we're like, stop, stop. And he said, this is my love. You know, this is, um, I, this is the way I get my love into you is, is through the food. And Papa Ju is very careful who cooked for him. And a lot of masters I've been around are like, they're picky. They don't like to go out to eat. Um, so you're you're the conduit for good vibes for for everyone that eats your food. So it's nice to you. They look also said like somebody who likes to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an ex girlfriend, and I tell her, yeah, I'm in shape, and she says, yeah, round is the shape. <laughs> but it's also nice for a cook to cook for somebody who likes to eat <laughs> it's true huh we're all the audience for each other and uh and it's sometimes it's good to recognize that uh that we play roles you know you're the you're the role of a cook now and we're introduced as a cook you might not be a cook you might be something else to somebody else to somebody else and so like I play a role right now, but I'm not taking taking my role seriously because I'm sincere and I want to serve. But I also know that I'm I'm not this, I'm not that. And we are. I just said uh, when I was waking here for the chair, I had a revolutionary thought came. Uh, because there is uh, that we're, what's not supposed to happen will not happen, and what's supposed to happen will happen. And so there's thought, a perfection to everything. Mm -hmm. It's an irrational, nonlinear perfection. But uh, it was like one of my first realizations, just like every moment there's, there's this perfection. That doesn't mean perfection in the high um ideal sense but uh it's it's ineffable it's it's uh you're just who you need to be at this moment and and with who you need to be and this is, this is it it's perfect you can't fight reality although you can still do the evolutionary path
This is Saraswati, who just joined our community today. <laughs> her, oh body, my God. her body has been here for four months or nine months. <laughs> Do they have sort of some gang ritual where they like beat you into the gang or like you have to like be hazed or they they like do some kind of ritual punishment or anything or do they just like yes, let you in is. yes yes it is <laughs> i want to hear all the dark secrets <laughs> See, now now it's that you're in them. you'll know you know they, they, they keep a secret from you the first four months but once you're in this this one was punished by having to play the cello oh. She played the cello in the band. Mm. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Welcome to that community. I, I respect uh, people that have all these choices to make. <laughs> Your idea of evening entertainment is watch people stare at each other on Zoom and it's a, a, an investment in yourself. Uh, so I have a question. Um, before I moved in, I had not so much um, experience with um, meditation. Um, yeah, somehow my question is re yeah related to this. Um, it's about how I can become really content with myself and not to want or to need something from the outside. Hmm. I think it's all about um, shifting your, the center of your identity to beingness and, and into your, your, your source, your heart the mind is always going to be restless and so we're breaking this habit of being in our mind and and so you know it's not an easy process because it's been a long habit so on the way you know be lighthearted about it don't be hard on yourself get off your own back and um and do what you have to do but just keep returning to presence and uh you know just claim some 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 happiness and joy in, in your existence because you know it is within you so um we just we just become our own worst enemy you know you can you can almost choose to like be a kid and 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 still you're being mindful and still you're um you know doing what you have to do in in community and for, for everybody but um um enjoy the path and don't be hard on yourself and and know that you know you have to wait a little bit for things to take effect sometimes we have this problem of that we think it's going to take forever to realize ourselves or it's going to that and that's an obstacle too right it just it is what it is you know and inhabit the state you're in and keep you know, and in, in, uh, keep edging toward mindfulness and, and home. But uh, yeah, you want to talk a little more about your question, where I'm, where I'm missing you, or or what 
what you want to address? I mean, your answer is really beautiful. Um, so, and it also had changed. I mean, it's it's not like it was in the beginning when I moved in. Um, it's really a process, so it's it's much more better now. Not so much thinking about what I want or what I think I need. So. It is really uh, relaxing somehow. And a message to you know everyone is the spiritual path is oftentimes like two steps forward and one step back. So if you make some some progress and realization or you 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 clear something, you get your mind quieter, then that creates a space for karma or thoughts or issues to bubble up from within that might have been held down by all the stuff on top of it before. So a lot of times we we can we think, oh, we've fallen from grace or or oh we were doing good and now we're not. And it's just recognize that uh we're gonna have ups and downs and it's two steps forward, one step back, and then there's gonna be two more steps forward. So you know go with that that flow and recognize that sometimes if you know if things come up it it's, doesn't mean it's a sign of falling back. It could be just part of the progress that uh, that the, the process goes. Mm, yes. Yeah. yeah, maybe also to look again on something when it's coming up again, it's not finished. Yeah, you know, um, repeating patterns are uh, usually a message for us. You know, like I said, life is like this hall of mirrors. And when something comes up again and again and again, um, it's really something to look at. We, we, uh -huh. uh, some people just want to be detached and ignore it. But if it's coming up again and again, it's probably within us that we're creating this repeating pattern. And if you don't want it to come up again and again, then, you know, sit with that and, and see where it's, where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to explore it and, um, and then it can maybe be dissolved at some day. Yeah, you know, an awareness itself is a medicine where you can explore it, you can feel into the root of it, you can just sit with it and be present with it. The, the one thing that doesn't help is ruminating about it. Like if you take your story and you spin your story all around of, you know, he said this, and then he did that, or she, da, 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 and you, you take the story and, and become a victim and, 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 and like chew on the pain of things. Because a lot of times we chew on our own pain, uh, that, that there's a part of us that like in, enjoys um, like ruminating on our suffering. So um, that's the caveat on exploring the uh, repeating things is like, don't make a habit, uh, you know, following in your misery. Mm, yes. Mm. Thank you. Nice to meet Thank you. you. I'm, it's nice to meet you too. I'm honored to be uh, welcomed into your world. Too. Oh, no. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Govindam Adi Purusham Maham Bajami. Govindam. I thought I should know a little something about this process, so I sort of skimmed through this part of Papaji's, um, I mean, uh, John David's uh, ambassador page, so I saw a little of your interview with uh, Satya, so I didn't use my omniscient powers to come up with that song. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, yeah, actually, I have, I have a very personal question because what's going on now at the moment, um, what comes up a lot of the time is um, that I feel very wounded emotionally because um, particular because I've been very much sexually rejected by women all my life. And um, I feel a lot at, about this wounding and I feel also kind of, yeah, I just feel a lot of being rejected, being wounded. And um, in two weeks, I will go to a place which is called Oshu University to look at this more closer. But if you can uh, share something about this topic, I'd be very happy. Tell me... Um... Tell me a little bit about like your childhood. Like what was it like your relationship with parents and early early life and stuff? Um, I had um, like very, very nice regular parents. Like um, we were kind of happy family and mm -hmm. maybe it's a small happy family because we were, in, mm -hmm. were living in a very strong structure, society structure. And um, for one thing which I remember is when I, the, the, my parents kept hiding their sexuality from me. And mm -hmm. when I was asking, there was always shame coming up and I kind of um, just copied that. So it was kind mm -hmm. of, um, I just took it. Yeah? And mm -hmm. um, there was also something um, of, let's say, some very strong I know structure which was like very high arrogance and very low um you would say very insecure below this high arrogance mm. uh, and this made me also a very easy victim of bullying and um yeah mm. this left like um i kind of had my structure and when somebody would attack or break it i would immediately fall apart like there would be no ground psychologically and um yeah this i had had strongly and what uh what has been uh have you had some like fulfilling relationships in the past and it feels more dry and needy now or um has it has this been a theme for a while uh, i um i i i wouldn't say i really had a completely fulfilling relationship yet Mm -hmm. it's um it's kind of i don't know if I, it's funny it's a little like tragic in that uh you know the like fear of rejection and and the neediness that builds up from that lack of connection um is itself an obstacle right if, mm -hmm. probably if you'd been having a a really sweet, yummy relationship would be. Uh, it would create a different space that, uh, when 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 you're lacking it and feeling rejected, like people can sense that, and so it's it's kind of hard to, um, or hard to break the uh, the the sort of vicious cycle of needing something and the not needing of it being what attracts what you need um i uh i used to uh i hung, I, I met this baba at the kumba mela once tantric baba and uh can i can i swear on one of these uh uh videos that anyway I'll, I'll i'll tone it down a little bit um, so I meet this Baba, Tantric Baba at the Kuma Mela. And I go to his little ashram room and uh, he said, I'm always in the state of sex. He didn't use that word. But, uh, and what I intuitively understood from him was that, you know, there's this field of presence from everyone and that he was um, 
communing in that field that he was present with everyone and and mm. and sharing energy so for that was you know his higher vision of of sex was just like being in the soup of everyone's being and energy um sometimes that attitude can soothe it a little i could you know hug and give massages to a whole bunch of people and feel like the the, the different imbalances in my energy like get equalized from that a little bit but um uh i'm just saying a few things but the the issue isn't uh it's not like you snap your fingers and and uh solve it either we go through that yeah i mean i can relate to this when you say i'm in a state of sex with everyone i really I can relate to this energetically and um, like this feeling of being extremely connected, but then there's some kind of um, psychologically, it doesn't manifest like that, even though I can feel it spiritually, because mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I did a lot of work on myself when it comes to um, this, yeah, yeah, I'm lacking maybe the psychological aspect of it. Mm. Yeah, you know, in, the, in, in this psychologically, um, psychologically, there's not answers for everything either. You know, you have to, mm -hmm. you know, recognize that. Okay, you know, psychologically, I feel this way, and uh, don't uh, worry about it too much. Okay, you're a you're a dude, and uh, you know, like in in India. They have a the Shiva Lingam, you know, it represents this creative power, but it's also phallus. And they pour milk over it to, you know, cool it down. So even Shiva has this problem. One thing to do with this like sexual energy um, is if you retain it and move it around, and energy follows attention. So you can feel this energy moving up and you can move it throughout your body and, and it gives you power. And then it becomes retained energy. Since you guys are going to talk to Margo and on today, might as well get tantric here. So having the, <laughs> the power of the power of this this the sexual energy which is also like the kundalini and the the life force energy within us by even however intense it is by holding it within yourself and circulating it it creates actually an attractive power it's only when it's it's grasping that people have to be like pushing it away
I am. I admire you for the fearlessness of being able to like raise a personal question and um, encourage you to use that fearlessness, not to take anything personally. Nothing is personal. Thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I also um, admire the space and your holding and the, I don't know, fatherliness, but you are like really like someone I feel very um, open to connect to. And yeah, very a lovely person. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will give hand over to the next. So. <laughs> nice to meet you. Bless. Wishing the best and highest for all the people in the room that uh, we have blessed Kieran. and uplifted. He's the, he's the drummer in our band. He's an expert drummer and he's the leader of the band. It's great to have music guy, huh? <laughs> it's the juice you know and I'm, I'm glad you guys have a band and like there's a certain amount of some of these non-dual satsangs don't do any band or kirtan stuff and you know, you've got to you've got to resonate the resonate the shakti within you know and when people are singing and playing music you uh, uh, uh entrain with that and and there's no way to be like you if to be uptight in it, you know, it just sort of naturally brings people out. So it's an important role and, and one where your being gets transmitted to everyone through the music.
um, the energies are very, often very strong in the body, like streaming um, through the body. And if it manifests through music, it is really wonderful. Then it uh, is a great power and also like going not only through the body, but through everything which is there yeah, to um, the other people in the room, the other parts of the band, of the band. And uh, now for the last weeks, there is a very strong energy also, but also in a bit darker mode. But um, this also affects the music. So if there is a lot of like pain triggered, then if there's music, it is a lot of strong energy and blissful energy. So this the the color of the energy turns then, and if the color is dark, it is um, yeah. I just try to accept and to be with it, and um, sincere and but there's also a lot of seriousness, and I love I <laughs> have to be more. A bit more have more ease in all this watching and inner work and all that stuff yeah, to doing this uh, to relax and to surrender and to um to let go and, and this this is a sometimes a bit serious doing yeah yeah you know like uh, <laughs> music's one of those things that uh, sometimes you'll know like you'll watch it uh, so musicians will start playing and at first they're thinking about it uh, and they're trying to do the thing. And then if they, if, if they know their instruments, well, see them into the thoughtless form of, of being in the, in the jam and the, the flow of the music. And there's, the music's not powered by serious, thinking anymore so you know, the self-consciousness is always a, a buzz kill for uh, um, for the heart of music so uh, but if you can see yourself being too serious and you can't get too hard on yourself for that because that's even more serious right so <laughs> it, it, it is a game to be go oh, I'm being serious and and um, and and try and uh, you know, try and try and let go without getting in a head trip about it. Yeah, music with music is possible. It helps. Yeah, it, it's just there is. Mm -hmm. It's not so serious. It's, yeah, sometimes you have to keep going for a while, and then you could just like drum yourself out of it. <laughs> or you could uh, join a heavy metal band in your one day off a month. And <laughs> there's, there's always been an aspect of music where people grind out their angst. It might be, you know, it used to be heavy metal and then there's dubstep. And, you know, there's always this form of music where people get really dark and they are argh, gnashing of teeth. And this is the way they like transmute their uh, that level of energy. And I don't know to what extent you can do that in a community like that or it's people could relate or it's appropriate, but I just want to acknowledge that there's that, there is that aspect of music that people use to like express something. Mm. You might have to go beat up a pillow or something before, before that song so that you, it's out of your system.
Mm. The other thing is some kind of emotions also like get in us at a body level, a little hatha yoga or something before music loosens it up. Good to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> Present love, and past,
We only have five minutes left and then we're all going to turn into pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't catch your name when you said to me. Oh, uh, sorry, this is Kamala. Kamala. Kamala? To see you. So lovely, thank you. This is Sagar, and today he has his 40th birthday. <laughs> so you're his birthday present. <laughs> I can think of all kinds of jokes and ways of teasing you about being 40, but um, I've reached a couple of milestones since then, so I better just keep it to myself. Mm -hmm. Do you have an advice how to uh, how to live or what? <laughs> it could be important like the next 40 years or more. <laughs> Vice words, some advice. So like I would suggest you do this thing, right? A spiritual thing of being present and mindful and you know working away at this thing. But you know play and enjoy the process at the same time. Don't take yourself too seriously. Um, you know, strike that balance. Be sincere, go within, but uh, you know, make it fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's for me anyway, you can make your own version of that just don't oppress yourself too bad <laughs> Hi, John. This is the ref. The referee is coming in for the. <laughs> I'm out. So, Carl, I want to say that this has been a really wonderful, really wonderful three hours. You know, really wonderful. So, I mean, I don't know really how to to what to say at this point, but I'm going to say something that just came to me, which I was a bit surprised about. This was a really, really wonderful, deep three hours. And I wanted to tell you that now I know what it must have been like to hang out with Ramana Maharshi. <laughs> because there's really a deep silence happened, you know? I know all these guys very well, and I'm completely impressed with the silence in this room. 
And uh, this is, of course, the connection everybody feels with you. So it must have been exactly like that down in the south of India, you know, in the good old days. So I'm very touched from that personally. And uh, I really give you a big thank you for this meeting, a wonderful meeting. Well, I'm, I'm really impressed that so many people were able to just sit here and drop into it. I think it was good we tuned into it uh, in the beginning. I think it's going to make, hopefully we'll um, cut some of the long sections out if you post it on your website. Otherwise, it'll be quite an unusual <laughs> satsang. But, uh, you know, I don't know what felt over on your side, but I was feeling it. I was, uh, um, so it's a co-creation. It's a symbiosis. So. Thanks for bringing some um, beautiful, like, people that can bear silence uh, to the table. Wishing everyone. I think when, like, when, we deep cut, peace and love. when we cut it, we'll cut out all the talking. It'll be completely silent. <laughs> It'll be a celebration of Bali Silence Day. Uh, so, big thank you. Thank you very much. Carl. Yeah, really much love to everyone. I hope I run into some of you in Rishikesh. Thank you for uh, this very welcoming and and like humble um, invitation to share with your beautiful people. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye you. now. Ciao.